Like, I know I should stop, but I fucking can't. You never know what's gonna make you, like, go eat your neighbor's dog. In order to understand what is a feeling, we need to understand what is an emotion. And an emotion is the execution of a very complex program of actions. And movements that are actually not muscular movements, but rather releases of molecules. Our brain is wired to look for threats or rewards. If one is detected, the feeling region of the brain alerts us through the release of chemical messages. When our brain detects a potential threat, our brain releases the stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. When we detect or experience something rewarding, such as someone doing something nice for you, our brain releases dopamine, oxytocin, or serotonin. These are the chemicals that make us feel good and motivate us to continue on the task or behavior. And uh, an emotion has, as a general purpose, uh, making life more survivable by taking care of a danger or taking care of an opportunity that we all have with a certain programmed nature that is modified by our experience. So individually we have uh, variations on the pattern. Then the feeling is actually a portrayal of what is going on in the organism when you're having an emotion. So it's really the next thing that happens. And so the emotions were placed there in evolution as incredibly smart devices that rather than having you think through the problem would deliver a solution and make sure that you would act right. It's in a way a, a contribution to a sort of our autopilot that we've inherited through all these millions of years of evolution. So if there is an opportunity, emotion is going to make sure that you, at some level, know that it's there and that you're going to have the tendency to act on it. One type is technically called dopamine receptor type 1 neurons, but in this animation, we'll call these urge neurons. The other is technically dopamine receptor type 2 neurons, but we'll call these control neurons. The urge neurons promote feelings of reward and behaviors aimed at repeating rewarding experiences. The control neurons dampen reward and inhibit behaviors that are associated with negative experiences. Normally, the two types of neurons work together to promote healthy behavioral choices. In contrast, when the researchers gave a new dose of cocaine to mice that already had many doses, the imbalance persisted much longer. The activity level of the urge neurons continued to rise and predominate over the control neurons for the entire 30-minute observation period. At first, this condition lasts only briefly, but after long-term use, it becomes sustained. And this image here illustrates our first findings, initially reported in cocaine abusers, that we went then to replicate in methamphetamine abusers, alcoholics, heroin abusers. And what we found was that the brain of addicted individuals had a reduction in the levels of dopamine D2 receptors. Dopamine D2 receptors regulate the function of the frontal areas of our brain that allow us to exert self-control. You know, I've never ever met an addicted person who wanted to be an addict. Can you imagine, can you imagine what it must be to want to stop doing something and not be able to do it? And you try, and you fail, and you try again, and you fail again, and again. I was just sitting on a couch, getting high for hours at a time. And that really, really, really sat me down and kind of tripped me out and made me realize, wow, smoking weed really isn't, it's not doing something, you know? Sitting still is still sitting still, whether you are high or sober. It's the same thing, you are really doing nothing. I didn't see that, I didn't wake up to that fact until I stopped doing it. Because addiction is highly 
tied to mental illness, whether it's depression, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia. Uh, so a lot of times it's hard to tell like what came first, the chicken or the egg. Was it the depression that came first and then somebody drank? Or did you drink and then you became depressed? I mean, it really is hard to tell what came first. So confused and mental health disorders are interlinked in different ways, which are sometimes overlapping. In some cases, a mental health disorder can be considered a risk factor for drug use, which may lead to the development of a substance use disorder. In other cases, drug use can trigger the development of a mental health disorder. Clinical practice has also shown that comorbid disorders often interact to make each other worse. It's a scan of traumatic brain injury. Your brain is soft and your skull is really hard. For drug abuse, the real reason not to use drugs, they damage your brain. Give it to me one time. Terrible. That's all I need. <laughs> camera looks like a fucking... Your camera, dude! There you go! Cam is so... I'm so <laughs> sorry! Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god, that was <laughs> such... Oh El Diablo! He's, He's seeing El Diablo! <laughs> Can you show us how you can move your arms, Emily? I can dougie. Uh, you can dougie. <laughs> and what yeah. about? Yeah, what? Yeah, looking good. What about your eyesight, sweetie? Uh, how? I know your eyesight was affected by this as well. Yes, it's getting a lot better day by day. I wanted to show Sam what happened to a group of users who took a homemade cocktail of chemicals to realize just how serious the consequences can be when you don't really know what you're putting into your body. After taking them, all the victims in the video had quickly developed symptoms similar to Parkinson's disease. Now what I want you to do is try to reach out and touch my finger. Try to get your right arm up there. Are you trying? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can't really do that right now. You can see the tremor's getting really worse. Let's try it on the other side. Can you do that? They're not at the moment. It did happen, and there are, they, are, they are essentially young guys like you putting chemicals into their bodies. What does it feel like that first day when you're off of it? Feels like hell. Feels like straight hell. Like, if you puke in, you stay uh, on the ground for Several hours. How are you feeling? Right now. Like what kills someone? So I uh, won't go back into strange ways and do 28 day detox. But that'd be pointless. Why would it be pointless going into strange ways? There's more spice in there and what's that on the streets? He recognized his own son as one of the walking dead. This was his son Peter Jr. just two years ago at a family wedding. This is my son Peter, the one I raised, the one I know, not the one I saw on TV. When you look at that picture of him happy and smiling, what goes through your mind? It breaks my heart. Look at that. 
There's no blood, by the way. Like this on my finger, this is all staff. Look, that's not blood. Oh man, it feels amazing. I'm out of work and I couldn't be happier because I'm no longer in pain. A teenage son who they love so much, of course, died after taking one hit of synthetic pot. That's 19-year-old Connor you see there, Connor Eckhart. He died July 16th after smoking spice. He slipped into a coma shortly after taking his first hit. Well, Connor had, uh, had had a bout with, um, with drug addiction, and he, uh, he was eight months clean and sober. He was very proud of his sobriety and had been doing just a fantastic job. Um, uh, his friends would tell you that he was the one who was rejecting anything that was going to pull him back towards an addictive lifestyle, but uh, one hit of spice has changed everything for him. In particular, uh, the patients that call the Poison Center tell me that they are suicidal, that they have negative thoughts that they just can't get rid of. Um, many of them are hearing voices, and that seems to go on even after they stop the drug. Dickie Sanders, an athletic young man and an avid BMX biker, Dickie had snorted the powder from a packet called Cloud Nine Bath Salt, and it sent him into waves of hallucinations right in the kitchen. He saw non-existent police cars and helicopters. He was counting the 20s, and now there's 21, 22, 23, 4, 25. There's, there's at least 30 police cars out there, Dad. And suddenly, those suicidal thoughts. He grabbed a butcher knife off the counter he was standing in front of, and impulsively just slashed his neck from ear to ear. For Dickie, that cut wasn't too deep. 24 hours later, his parents found him here in his bedroom, face down, bleeding, a rifle at his feet. So, baby, he's dead. We lost him. He's gone. He took his life because he is just scared out of his mind. His drug destroyed him. Yeah. Lips, pale face, breathing in snowflakes, burnt lungs. Lights gone, days end, struggling to pay rent, long nights, strange men. They say she's in the class A team, stuck in her daydream. Been this way since 18, but lately her face seems slowly sinking, wasting, crumbling like pastries. And they scream the worst things in life. To see the person I love the most disappear and be replaced by someone different. I hate the sight of her with those drugs, but no matter how hard I try to stop her, I only received a beating as a thank you. They destroyed my life, but luckily, I survived. But there are those who aren't so lucky. How can we stop them from becoming just another statistic? We live a life full of unpredictability and chaos. Everything changes from day to day, nothing staying the same except our constant fear and insecurity. Due to our childhood experiences, many of us lack the basic social skills needed to live a day to day life. We feel angry and hurt and try everything in our power to make things better in order to live a better life. Some of us are fortunate enough to not be subject to our parents' rage, while others have to live with the physical and emotional scars of our parents' misery. Many of us suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, sleeping and eating disorders, anxiety, and depression. As COSAs, we are three to four times as likely to become drug or alcohol addicts as a result of our parents' choices. It can become hard for some of us to focus in school, reach our full potential, bring friends around our families, and to take on big responsibility. We have trust issues and we feel guilty and ashamed of who we are and where we come from. People can be COSAs before they're even born. Each year, between 550,000 and 750,000 children are born after prenatal exposure to drugs and or alcohol. Prenatal drug exposure can cause many birth defects, including but not limited to growth deficiencies, nervous system functions, small eye openings, a small brain and head, as well as heart malformations. Julian was still have to get used to saying was. From therapies to hospitals to emergency rooms to psychiatric hospital. Why won't you stop? Why are you doing this? Please stop. It's 
hard not to feel angry. And so that morning I was going to pick out flowers for mom for Mother's Day and my stepdad and my brother Isaac um, texted me and said, call, it's urgent, Julian's dead. And I said, what? I just thought we'd have more time. <laughs> These things exist, that drugs exist, that hardships exist, and this is a reality that people face. And I faced it. Interestingly, dopamine is increased, not just by rewarding pleasurable stimuli, but also by stimuli that predict a reward, which we call conditioned stimuli. And again, this is a brilliant solution. Because when you increase dopamine in your brain, that enhances the motivation and sustains the drive for you to do the behaviors that are necessary to procure the reward. Drugs, you know, they ruin people, they ruin lives. I mean. Do you want to get sober? Of course, I will get sober, not wanting to, I will. Again, I... <sighs> Yo, what's up guys? It's John and I'm back. Uh, I'm not dead, so uh, I'm still alive. Go placidly amid the noise and haste, and remember what peace there may be in silence. As far as possible, without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. Speak your truth quietly and clearly, and listen to others, even to the dull and the ignorant. They too have their story. Avoid loud and aggressive persons. They are vexations to the spirit. If you compare yourself with others, you may become vain and bitter, for always there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans. Keep interested in your own career However humble, it is a real possession in the changing fortunes of time. Exercise caution in your business affairs, for the world is full of trickery. But let this not blind you to what virtue there is. Many persons strive for high ideals, and everywhere life is full of heroism. Be yourself, especially do not feign affection. Neither be cynical about love, for in the face of all aridity and disenchantment, it is perennial as the grass. Take kindly to the counsel of the years, gracefully surrendering the things of youth. Nurture strength of spirit to shield you in sudden misfortune. But do not distress yourself with imaginings. Many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive him or her to be, and whatever your labors and aspirations in the noisy confusion of life, keep peace in your soul. With all its sham, drudgery, and broken dreams, it is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful. Strive to be happy. <laughs>